Keats's famous poem, it's Ode, Ode to a Grecian Urn, I think it is, right? Is that the one? Yeah. Truth is beauty, beauty, truth. That's all ye know on earth and all you need to know. I think, what rubbish. Nothing could be more wrong than that. <laughs> this is my conversation with James Robert Brown. James, or Jim as he likes to be called, is Professor Emeritus at the University of Toronto. He is a philosopher interested in philosophy of mathematics, philosophy of science, and a whole lot more. He is, his interest in mathematics range from foundational mathematics to mathematics as applies to physics and beyond. He is widely known for his important contributions on understanding the nature of thought experiment. Uh, recently, he's become interested in ethics. He is the author of many, many books that discuss these topics that I highly recommend to anyone who's interested. We chatted about math, ethics, aesthetics, the history of the sciences, some problems in the practice of doing science, and a whole lot more. I hope you enjoyed listening to this conversation half as much as I did. How did you become interested in mathematics in the first place, in the philosophy of mathematics? Um... I, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I, uh, my undergraduate degree was uh, philosophy. I took some math, though the kind of math I got interested in uh, as a typical philosophy student was foundational stuff. It was uh, logic and set theory, that kind of thing. Uh, I find that the kind of math I'm interested in now is uh, a lot more just classical analysis and stuff like that. So I've had to teach myself an awful lot of math. And I'm also interested in the math as it, as it, as it applies to physics. And um, so uh, I'm teaching myself a lot of that stuff too. So I've been doing that for several years now, sort of puttering around uh, and, uh, and learning stuff here and there and uh, interacting with physicists and mathematicians whose interests overlap with mine and well, it's been many years of this. Was the goal always to come to or arrive at Platonism or to work on the foundational questions? Oh, no, but Platonism, uh, I, I found myself um, being persuaded of Platonism rather early on, um, surprisingly early on, and I haven't much wavered since then, which makes me worry that I'm hopelessly dogmatic and inflexible. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway... <laughs> It's, I'm an old dog now, and it's too late to try and learn new tricks. So I shall do my best to just plow on. Okay, um, the Platonism came pretty easy. Uh, I guess it was, in, in a sense, it's very natural. Um, a philosopher's version of Platonism isn't natural. It's, it's too embellished. But uh, for an ordinary working mathematician, they're all Platonists, or almost all are Platonists. If you ask them just simple questions like, um, do you think you're making this up? Or do you think you're discovering stuff? More like a physicist. And they'll say, oh, no, we're discovering stuff. We're not making this up. Now, they'll, of course, qualify that for little things where they can, you know, make up little formal systems and play with them. And they're interesting. And, of course, they'd say, well, you know, that's not something I discovered. I'm sort of playing with it. However, once I set those initial principles uh, in play, wholly arbitrary though they were, there are consequences that are like, uh, almost like platonic consequences. Sort of the relationships between the axioms or the first principles and what I derive as theorems, those have a kind of Platonistic status. They would say things like that. So anyway, uh, you, you actually have to bend over backwards, I think, to reject that view um, most ordinary people don't have strong views one way or the other about it. If you ask ordinary people, they'll say, yeah, mathematicians um, are making discoveries. Others might say, well, we lay down some rules and we derive the consequences. Um, they might say that. But as I say, most working mathematicians, they're going to be Platonists. Yeah, I mean, it almost seems just like you have to go to some application of mathematics, some specified application, often beyond foundational mathematics, to consider another interpretation. I mean, the thing that always comes to mind are the cognitive sciences, uh, or anything to do with the mind. I think that's where 
you ha you often still sway away from Platonism because you find some evidence that fits better if you take up a different interpretation? Well, uh, that's not clear to me that that's true. Um, so we can we can have a little fight about that. Um, the the people. Yeah, I mean, I don't mean as a matter of fact or as a matter of finding. Uh, I just mean as a matter of analyzing why people might sway away from Platonism. You yeah, sure. Um, before cognitive science came along, there was a popular Darwinian view uh, about the origin of math. So people, philosophers who didn't like Platonism, they thought, no, come on, it's crazy, it's weird, it's unbelievable. And then they'll say, look, we, uh, but, they, they, but they would agree that um, certain things seem so profoundly true and we can't shake them away. So we have to account for that. If you don't want Platonism to account for that, they have a handy alternative. Darwin, our species has just come to think this way, got hardwired. People who did think this way tended to survive. People who didn't think this way tended not to survive. Anyone who says, well, there are two lions on the left and there are 20 lions on the right so our chances of survival are best if we run at the 20. <laughs> now, there were such people who thought like that, and they are not your ancestor. And so it just becomes hardwired, okay? That's, that's, the, that's the claim. Um, I think you can, you know, it sounds plausible, as long as you stick to very elementary mathematics, you know, low-level arithmetic, uh, very elementary geometry, and so on. But once you start getting in any way sophisticated, once you start dealing with infinite sets or, um, or, or complex manifolds or topological vector spaces or anything like that, the idea that it might be just hardwired in us is, is, is really pretty close to preposterous. Right. So yeah. before we go forward, let's have a formal definition of Platonism as you see it. Uh, don't ask me for a formal definition. Ask me only for a, a reasonable characterization so that we can have a, a discussion. So I would say uh, Platonism is the, uh, well, a couple of ingredients, I suppose. One is that it involves abstract objects. Okay? These are not material objects. These are entities that exist, if they exist at all, or they exist outside of space and time. Um, the second ingredient is that they are completely independent from us. We are not making them up. Um, we are discovering the, their existence and their properties. Um, I like this way of characterizing it. I've been happy, and most people, most Platonists would you know, say something along that, those lines. It's become slightly problematic recently. Um, notice that the first ingredient I said Platonic entities exist outside of space and time. You can't find the number 27 anywhere in the universe. It's just outside. Um, the problem is that um, in quantum gravity, if you follow quantum gravity, uh, those folks are, are making the claim that um, space and time somehow emerge from something more basic. Um, if that's true, the easy characterization of saying numbers are outside of space and time. Well, well wait, what <laughs> now if space and time are, it's sort of, we, we just sort of space and time are sort of given and stuff like you and me, we're inside space and time and trees are inside space and time and numbers are outside of space and time. Easy, but once you've got space emerging and you've got a, a something that could exist prior to space and time, then the definition is a little, you know, a little dodgy. We're gonna, we may have to fine tune it. But we, but anyway, for any discussion of Platonism today, that should just be left aside. That's something to keep in the back of one's mind and think about in the long run. So those kinds of approaches in quantum mechanics, for example, do you see them as shifting the goalpost forward? No, I don't or... know what I don't know what to make of it. So. Um, um, uh, I have a couple of friends who work on in, in uh, uh, quantum gravity, and I sometimes talk to them. And sometimes, after talking to them, I think, "Oh, it's easy. I just—it's just an easy tweaking. 
to recharacterize what I mean by plainness. And other times I'm worried. So I'm, it's, it's, it's not settled in my mind what to do with it. But for the most part, I think, all right, that's just a rough characterization. Platonic entities are outside of space and time. And, <clears throat> and uh, that's what makes them different than the, the world that science is interested in namely stuff inside space and time. Yeah, I mean, I think if anything is to come out of that line of inquiry, it it does need to be flushed out a whole lot more before Oh yeah, yeah. you can I, start making philosophical I, claims that have any coherence yeah. one, but also any consequence. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's also, I mean, that characterization leads right into the fundamental problem as most see it with Platonism. They say, well, Come on, you mean these things are outside of space and time? How do you know anything about them? They are inaccessible. We are inside space and time. We know about stuff like, here's my, here's my iPhone. How do I know I'm holding the iPhone in my hand? Well, there are photons bouncing off the iPhone into my eye and so on. And everything I know, I can account for with some sort of causal chain. That, uh, that I have to that, that object, but nothing like that in the platonic realm. I, I sometimes make jokes, you know, uh, sure there are, there's little, there's little platons coming, <laughs> coming, from, coming from mathematical yeah. objects into the mind's eye. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole platonic field. Yeah. So mathematical explanation versus representation. You've said in this book, the Platonism Naturalism book, that we should think of mathematical knowledge as, or sorry, mathematics as representing rather than explaining one world. Oh, or just literally history. describing. Right. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, the easiest way to show it is uh, if, I, um, uh, if I just use a simple analogy. Okay, so suppose Asher, I want to say, gosh, you're the smartest person I've ever met. You would be wrong, okay. but... Uh, well, I could do it like this. I could say, Asher, you're Albert Einstein. Or I could say, I could say, now that's a, that's a metaphor, okay? You're not literally Einstein. I'm using Einstein as an analogy, but by using that analogy, I can convey something about you. That would be a, a representation of you. Now, now, not everybody, not everybody uses these terms the same way. So, I, I only want to say literal description versus uh, analogical representation. Okay. So, if I say you're Einstein, that's an analogical representation. If I say you're extraordinarily clever, that's a literal description. I'm just a, attributing the property to you. You're very smart. Right. So one is a direct translation and the other is a shared property between the two. Yeah. Could be. The, but the point is metaphor, analogy, model. I think that's how mathematics works. I can, do, I can literally describe you by uh, you know, listing your properties. You are this tall, you weigh this much, you have two eyes, you have and so on and so on. Those will be your literal properties. And then I can metaphorically account for aspects of you. I can say, you're, uh, you are Einstein, you are, maybe you're indecisive. I could say, you are Hamlet, you are, you know, and, 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 I, and I can convey a whole lot of stuff about you. It's very revealing, but it's not like a literal description. Now, the way math works, people often say, a mathematical description of nature. You hear that phrase all the time. I believe there is no such thing. I believe the way math works is by setting up a model, an analogy. It's like, it's like, it's, it's rather than saying you are smart, literal, I say you are Einstein, metaphor. Math works like that. It's that analogical way. Uh, this is, sorry, this is applied math. So you can never quite have, or science can never quite have a description of nature, it can only have a model of nature. No, it can have a description of nature, but not a mathematical description of it. A mathematical model of nature, yes. That's how it works. And you can do spectacular things with it. 
I mean, you can, you can organize nature with it. You can make spectacularly wonderful, accurate predictions and so on. But here's one thing you cannot do. You can't explain anything. Mathematics does not explain. It models, it tracks, it does a whole lot of stuff, but it doesn't explain. Uh, let me give you another simple example. Uh, if I had a little balance beam here, and with, you know, with little pans to hold things, and I've got two apples here, and I've got three apples here. What's gonna happen? It's gonna go like this. The three apples will go down, and the two apples will go up. Give me an explanation. If I said three is greater than two, you'd say, no, that's, that's true, but it's no explanation. The explanation is, you're gonna say, well, mass, there's more mass here, and gravity is having its effect on the greater mass, and that's it. But three is greater than two will track what's going to happen, but three is greater than two does not explain why this, this clump, these, these apples went down and those apples went up. That's a very trivial example. But I mean, if you take sophisticated examples where math does something, you know, like you're using Hilbert space um, in, in a quantum mechanical situation, then you see all of this. People can get mesmerized with the math and they, and they get the idea that the math is somehow doing the explaining, okay? So I think that's just a mistake. It's modeling and it's modeling brilliantly, but it is not explaining. Do you think, just a bit of a side question here, but do you think that the beauty in mathematics, the perceived aesthetics in mathematics can sometimes be distracting? like the need to come up with an eloquent theory or the perceived awe-inspiring nature of mathematics can be a yeah. bit distracting that, from... That's, that, that's, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure what to think of it. Um, I think probably I'm a bit skeptical. When uh, I think people often overdo uh, aesthetic claims, uh, but I think it's probably true in math and in physics and any other science. It, it's a it's a problem across the board. Um, I'm, uh, I think some things are really beautiful. Unquestionably, they are objectively beautiful. But whether that is evidence for their truth, I'm less inclined to believe that. Though I'm prone myself to look at something and I think, oh, that's so beautiful, it's gotta be right. But, but that's not my considered opinion. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's fair enough. I mean, at the end, it might be a trivial question, but I think oftentimes people can, and myself included, get biased from our aesthetic yeah, yeah, line towards something. You can. And... Um, I haven't much thought about it in, in math or in physics, but I, but I have a little. There's a couple of really interesting books. I don't know if people watching the podcast would be interested. There's one by James McAllister uh, from several years ago. It's called Beauty and Revolution in Mathematics, I think it is. Very interesting claim, and that is your aesthetic sense is formed by the theories you grow up with. So if you're trained in classical physics, you began to think that Newtonian solutions to anything is, that's so beautiful. And, and it, has, uh, it, has, uh, it has an unfortunate effect, and that is it makes you very conservative. And when you see something new, there's a kind of hostility to anything that's, that's new because it doesn't fit your aesthetic sense, which was developed uh, uh, along with learning Newtonian mechanics. That's a really interesting book. And there's another one uh, quite recently by S Sabina, <coughs> excuse me, Sabina Hossenfelder. It's called Lost in the Math, I think is, is the name of the book. And she's very hard on uh, her fellow physicists for getting carried away with <clears throat> with the aesthetics. She condemns it at every I mean, turn. I think yeah. the more that you move across disciplines, the need for beauty gets a little less tempting. And the need for description explanation, no matter how beautiful or ugly it might be, gets a lot more overriding. Um, yeah, but, but we can move on. The... Representation versus description thing. Yeah. Uh, so as I understand it, mathematics can never quite build a 
it can only really build a model of the world. It can't give a description, whatever a description might mean or not mean. But what is the consequence of that? Like for from our folk intuitions, from someone working outside of mathematics, what is the consequence of that really, really deep point? Uh, I'm not sure. It might be the case that you can generate um, genuine explanations using math, but it'll be in a very circuitous way. So uh, here's reality and here's my math model and they have a structural similarity. That's, uh, that's pretty typical. And, uh, but this doesn't explain this, but you might by studying this figure out what's going on here that would actually do the explaining here. Um, and sort of like, uh, well, back to my apples, th two apples and three apples, it's, uh, arithmetic does not explain this, but, but knowledge that you've got three apples here and two apples here, that might make you think, oh, it's what's really going on is there's more mass in this side than that side. And gravity is having this, there's a stronger force on this side than the other. And that's what's doing it. So the math can help you figure out what's causally going on. Uh, uh, by the way, I should say, my instincts when it comes to explanation is that you look for the cause. Okay, to explain something is to cite the cause of that thing. Okay, and um, uh, it's got to be a lot more sophisticated than that. That's just, uh, you know, to a first approximation. But, but math isn't causally efficacious at all. And, uh, and uh, so, but it can help reveal whatever causally is going on there. That's just by, you know, studying it as suggestive and I think, oh, looking at, at the math here, there's got to be something here that's maybe, you know, is really the cause of why this one went down and that one went up. It's not the numbers. Okay, so I think this leads into applied versus pure mathematics. What is the distinction between the two? Oh, that's a wonderfully interesting question. And um, um, now I'll give you a philosopher's answer to start with, which I think, well, I think it's right, but it's uninteresting. I think there's actually two answers and they focus on different things. The philosopher's answer is simply this. Um, uh, pure math is involve, involves nothing but math. And once you bring in physical concepts or financial concepts, you know, you're talking about money or... When you literally apply it. Yeah. Um, then you're doing applied mathematics. So the most trivial example, which exemplifies this, is simply two plus two equals four. That's pure math. Two apples plus two apples is four apples. That's applied math. Now, it's really a boring distinction. But what it does is it separates the two realms the physical realm, the non-mathematical realm from the mathematical realm. It just keeps them, keeps them separate. And I sort of like that. So, uh, so in that one sense, I like the philosopher's distinction. It is absolutely fruitless. Mathematicians look at that and they curl up their nose quite rightly. Well, mixed. They're sort of right and sort of wrong. What a working mathematician I think would say is what makes something pure math is that it is mathematically interesting. So you can have you can apply math in the philosopher's sense to some really interesting bit of physics, and a, and a mathematician can get interested in it and says, "I don't give a damn about the energy levels of an atom." But my God, Hilbert space is really interesting math. Wow, that's that's wonderful stuff. And if they're attracted to it for mathematical reasons, as opposed to they want to solve a physics problem, then, then that's what would make it um, a pure math. Now that's gotta be just a rough characterization. I don't know if we've got time. You may wanna just edit this out at, at, at any point. I'll give you a simple, I'll give you a simple example. Uh, it comes from Paul Helmholtz. Uh, and he used it as an example of uh, the difference between pure and applied mathematicians okay so he said all right suppose you're running a, tour, a tennis tournament and you got 587 tennis players okay and uh, the way the tournament goes is that the, the first player will play the second 
and one will be eliminated and the winner goes on to the next round. And you keep doing that uh, until you've got a final winner. How many tennis matches are you going to have? Like if you were the organizer, you'd have to rent the tennis courts. How many times? Okay. This is a hard problem. And you think, well, I could think of a really stupid way. I could say, well, A plays B, that's one. B plays C, that's two. And then each of those winners play against each other. That's three. You could work through this starting with, I don't know what number I gave you, 587 or something like that, you know? And that's a terrible way to grind it out. <clears throat> Here's a better way, which, which is the way it strikes most people to say, well, um, half the people are going to go on to the next round. So you take your first number and you just divide by two. And then at the second round, you divide that number by two and you divide by two and you keep dividing by two until you're down to a single winner. There's one catch, just a small catch. Sometimes you'll have an even number and sometimes you'll have an odd number. So whenever you have an odd number, you just have to give that, give one person to buy into the next round. Okay. You can do that. Won't take you too long. It's tedious. Halmo says, if that's the way you did it, you're an applied mathematician. He didn't like applied mathematics. He thought it was stupid. A way, no, he, he said, no, those are good people and the world hangs on them. They make the world a better place. But it's just, a way, if you've got a, well, if you have a soul, you wouldn't do that. Okay. So he said, look at it. All you, what a pure mathematician would do is reconceptualize the problem. Stop thinking about winners going on. Start thinking about losers. And notice this, every match has one loser. Every player loses exactly once, except the final winner. That means if you had 587, initial players, you'll have 586 chess matches. It's as easy as that. And not only that, but you can, you can generalize this immediately. No matter how many you've got, if you've got N initial players, you have N minus one tennis matches. That's a really Remember fun you see, proof. You think, oh, wow, isn't that beautiful? And you think that was a pleasure to think through, even though I don't give a damn about tennis. And that's what and that's what makes it pure mathematics, even though it involves something well outside the, the platonic realm, as it were. So those so those are two very different characterizations of the pure versus applied distinction. I think they're both legitimate. I think if you're a working mathematician and you want to be fruitful, Follow the standard mathematical one and don't be afraid to use physical examples when you're thinking about mathematics. Don't try to just keep it narrow and keep physics out of it, which is which is what philosophers often tend to do. They don't they don't like their mathematics muddied with, um, you know, physical or, or financial concepts. They want to just keep it, you know, like pure set theory. Where you've got nothing but the, the empty set and iterations of the empty set. So let's talk about empiricism first. About what? Empiricism. Sure. And hopefully we can share a good cry together. Because I know you rally pretty heavily against empiricism. But what um what what is the impulse for believing in empiricism? Is it just that you want to ground all truth in experience and you only want to have empirical concepts and see greater prospects in that approach? I think I think empiricism comes first from just everyday experience. Like before you start becoming an empiricist in math, um, you would be just committed to empiricism in everyday life. So obviously, sensory experience teaches us a ton of stuff about the world. And um, so uh, everybody is happy with, with learning from experience. And then they want to add other stuff. So some might want to add um, um, biblical teachings. Okay. And um, so, uh, so some people say, well, look, I'm not sure I should add biblical teachings. I don't have any evidence for this. And it's telling me stuff that's frankly kind of weird. 
and uh, I'd like to know why I should believe that, um, I don't know, take, take anything you like. Why should I believe that the earth is 6,000 years old? I've got other ways of figuring that out and I'm finding them a bit more reliable. So eventually you get around to not just questioning <clears throat> these particular non-empirical claims to knowledge, but you begin to reject them. You begin to say, I'm just going to push all of that out in principle. And then, and then, uh, and then it can, you, can, you can maybe overdo it. So uh, a behaviorist eventually came to say, look, here's what I can, here's what I know about human behavior. I see human behavior. I use words like anger and hunger and uh, um, uh, jealousy and a whole lot of things. But I'm not sure whether, and people think it's going on in here, but I can't see in here. When, when, I, when I say, Asha, you're, you're angry, what I mean, or I, I talk to somebody else, say, Asher's really angry. Watch out, <laughs> don't, don't push the wrong buttons. Okay, what do I mean? This is a behaviorist. Say, well, <clears throat> what it means is he's prone to shouting. Um, he's, um, his blood pressure is, you know, gone through the roof. Um, he's red in the face. He's frothing at the mouth. He's hitting people. <laughs> okay, what I can do is, is describe literal behavior that, that is observable in principle. And I define your emotion, anger, which I cannot experience, in terms of the things that I can experience, your actual behavior. Now, uh, that's a super empiricist point of view. And it was found not to be so successful that people who said, okay, we went through this behaviorist period, uh, and we find that it just doesn't account for, you know, far too much. And there's got to be stuff going on in here that we can't literally see, but we can hypothesize about it and then test the consequences, which are empirical. Okay, so that's probably where empiricism in, in the natural sciences is today. Same with the physics. We went through a period where we only believed in tracks in cloud chamber um, and, and words like electron was just a, it didn't mean anything except a summary of, well, there'll be tracks like this and there'll be tracks like that. Don't take a, the word electron too seriously. But now we do, we just think, no, it's just, that's just a crap point of view. Of course there are electrons and we understand them realistically. This is going beyond literal experience for everything, but it's still grounded in experience. So I say, if you're gonna say something about electrons, I want to know the consequences for tracks in a cloud chamber. Then I can test it. And if you say, well, if I send if I send an electron through the cloud chamber with this magnetic field, there will be a white streak which you can see and it'll look like this. And if I send it through with that speed and that magnetic field, there'll be a track that looks like this. And if all of that pans out, I say, hmm, this idea of um, an electron Sounds pretty good. I'm gonna I'm gonna start believing in it literally. Take it seriously. Okay. So anyway, that's terrific. Now, when it comes to numbers, and let me because I'll muddy the waters here a bit. When it comes to numbers and ethics, mathematics and ethics, they're not empirical at all. You're just not going to hook up to the empirical world with, with either of those. Um, I can I can literally see you kill somebody else. You pull out a gun, and because we've already established you're very bad tempered, <laughs> bang bang. You know, you say some horrible things to this person, and you go bang bang, and uh, that's what I literally see. And it's only in with using what I see that I make the judgment that that was that was an unjust act. That was a case of murder. Okay, that's the moral part. The moral part we don't literally see. Well, I'm not so sure about that, but let's tentatively just say that because that's the common view. Um, and mathematics is just like that. You can't you can scour the universe and you will never come across the number 27 would be great if we could keep the number 27 under glass in Paris, along with the meter stick, 
you know, it could just be the standard 27. Uh, but there's nothing like that. And um, so it's always been a problem. Ethical knowledge has been a problem and mathematical knowledge has been a problem if you are an empiricist, even a pretty liberal empiricist. Yeah, I mean, is it the case that empiricism, uh, I, I think you always begin with empiricism in the infancy of a science because that's the evidence that's best available to you or the one that's most compelling. Yeah, yeah. But is it the case that as a science matures yeah. and expands the domain of things that it wants to explain or let's go of ground to another field because of explanatory complexity, uh, is it the case that as that happens, a a field shifts away, a science shifts away from empiricism sure. to what we would call, or what in a working way we would call platonic? Yeah, I wouldn't use the word platonic. Um, I would be, I would be happy to use it, but I mean, other people will will agree with your characterization, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't do that. They would just say, yeah, yeah you just start to introduce theoretical entities, and you'll introduce, you know, electrons and protons and you'll introduce quarks and you'll have magnetic fields and you'll have quasars and you'll have dark matter. Dark matter is a great one, you know, absolutely undetectable, at least so far, <clears throat> but thought to be necessary in order to account for certain um, uh, phenomena in any galaxy. So those are, those are wonderful examples. Uh, we do increasingly introduce these theoretical entities to or help us organize and predict and, and all of that stuff. So what about math? Well, the only person who was um, an empiricist about math uh, was uh, John Stuart Mill, who uh, thought that um, uh, mathematical truths like five plus seven equals 12 are just extreme generalizations of of, uh, of our experience. So we, we play with apples and bananas and so on and uh, all sorts of things. And eventually we keep abstracting, abstracting, but based all on empirical experience, you get five plus seven equals 12. Um, it's uh, extremely unbelievable. It begins to crumble as soon as you introduce the concept of zero uh, in arithmetic. And now Mill, uh, now of course, some Mill could stick to his guns and say, zero is illegitimate. Negative numbers are illegitimate. That's, that's just bad mystical mathematics. Don't believe it. <coughs> but no one's, going to, no one's going to accept that. So it's really hard. Um, we, I think the most you can say is that, you know, empirical experience, your mother teaches you elementary arithmetic with, with bananas and apples and <clears throat> who knows what, counting fingers and so on. Um, but once you get going, those are more like triggers. They, they just help you. <clears throat> and maybe it's a bit like uh, language. I mean, the standard Chomsky claim is that your parents don't teach you language. They don't teach you grammar. They give you examples and, and it's already built here. And, and those ex you need those examples in order to sort of prime the prompt, pump uh, inside. Yeah, poverty of stimulus. Yeah, Ex yes, exactly. You're exactly right. Uh, and in fact, your parents can be uh, appallingly ungrammatical. <laughs> half, of, half of their sentences can be ungrammatical. And yet somehow or other, you're, you're able to, to construct correctly the, 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 the grammar of your, of your language. You just have to learn the vocabulary. Yeah, I mean, going back to the evolutionary example, uh, you can make similar arguments for poverty of mathematical exposure. Yes, like, yes. Yeah, I know Roger Penrose, for example, is famous for having characters of this, where he talks about how mathematics or the practice of mathematics or the development of any enterprise that flushes out mathematical truth could ever be shown to provide advantage in any kind of niche that we can imagine. Right, right. Uh, and uh, I, I'm on side with that um, completely. Yes, he's a fellow Platonist, fellow, a fellow traveler. So, constructivism. Beyond the epistemology of it or the cognitive science of it, do you have any sympathetic views towards it in terms of its philosophical value? Uh, uh, sorry, of, of what? Mathematics? Constructivism or oh, intuitionistic mathematics? Oh, intuitionism and constructivism. Oh, um, 
no, I have no sympathy with them as views about mathematics. However, um, and this is something I don't know much about at all, but I'll, I'll take what my friends tell me uh, as true. They say um, uh, intuitionistic mathematics is, um, uh, turns out to be very valuable in computer science. And in a certain sense, you can see why. Um, if you're dealing with computers, you are always dealing with finite systems. They can be you know, very large and so on, but you're never dealing with uh, uh, the genuine continuum. You can play with what they call real numbers, but they're always truncated you know, after 10 or 20 decimal places or something like that in order to do a computation. Um, it turns out that um, a lot of the features of, um, um, that we think of as, as characterizing um, computable functions and well, computer science in general, are, are, are close kin to some things that are going on in intuitionistic mathematics. So, so I can believe that, that studying, a computer scientist studying intuitionistic mathematics, that, yeah, that'll be very valuable for them. But my heart is in old fashioned maximal Platonism and none of this uh, fussing around with merely uh, potential infinities. So do you think that there's a limit to, and I know I'm going to ask you to speculate here, but do you think that there's a limit to computation? Because I think you're right. That's the reason people rally behind intuitions like mathematics, because in some sense you can use it well, to see the universe. There's a fair bit of you know, theoretical computer science, which I, I'm, I guess is right. Um, <clears throat> you know, most functions are not computable. That follows exactly from um, uh, Turing established that you know, in the 30s with the, with the Turing machine, showing <clears throat> what, a com what a computation would be. And there can be only a, a countable infinity of, of, of such functions, uh, yet there's a, an uncountable infinity of functions. So most of them are simply not computable. I take it that no, ma no matter how computation improves, that, that will never be overcome. Uh, quantum computers can't calculate infinitely fast which is what you would have to do to, to compute <clears throat> all these in, in, uh, uncomputed, currently uncomputable functions. It's not just a practical matter um, of speed, it's a, a, a principled result. However, it is possible, and I did learn this from um, a friend of mine who was a fellow graduate student, and he established a result which absolutely is utterly fantastic. Um, it's philosophically fantastic for current computer scientists. I don't think they worry about it because it's not a practical matter. I thought computer science was something that existed in Plato's heaven. I think I was wrong. I think uh, uh, the theory of computation depends very much on the physics in which a computation, the physical realm in which a physical computation takes place. We hardly ever mention it, but Turing machines are Newtonian. They, they take place in Newtonian space and time. Computation takes time, and, <clears throat> and there's a, a, a finite but unbounded memory for this thing, and, and so on. Okay, now I'll just give you a hand wavy alternative to this. If you get outside the Newtonian realm and you throw a Turing machine into a black hole, as it approaches the event horizon, um, it can be sending signals to another us outside the outside the black hole, and it's sending signals to us. And uh, what it, it's it's it, this is weird physics, okay? It's weird physics that we're going to play on. One of the things that we cannot do with a Turing, <coughs> excuse me with a Turing machine in Newtonian space-time is, is calculate all of the instances of fair, um, Goldbach's conjecture. <clears throat> you know, it, it's uh, every even number greater than two is the sum yeah. of two primes. There are infinitely many examples to check and it would take an infinite amount of time uh, to check them. However, if we set a Turing machine to, to check each one, as it's falling into mm -hmm. a black hole, it can be sending signals. I just checked four, it's the sum of two primes. Just checked six, it's the sum of two primes, <laughs> okay? 
Now here in this realm, that's not gonna be a happy ending. You're just never gonna to get to the end. But as it falls into the black hole, what we do is have uh, relative to the, these two frames, one is, an, is there's going to be an infinite amount of time pass in one frame and a finite amount of time pass in our frame. That means in its frame, it can check all infinitely many examples and send the signals to us. And uh, it's, a, it's a clever way of setting this up and the signaling it takes a, a bit of uh, uh, complication, but you get the idea. The thing is, what is a computable function in this Newtonian world where we are thinking of Turing machines, even though we're thinking of it's highly abstract, it's really, <clears throat> it's really uh, to be done in a, a realm like this. Uh, once you change a, the physical realm sufficiently, what's computable and what isn't might change. And that was an example. If in no way is it a practical thing. I mean, we're not going to be able to throw a Turing machine into a black hole in just the right way and so on. But what it does is show something philosophically really, really interesting and important. So it's not the case then that computation is the most fundamental thing that can be used to then model everything in our physical universe. No, I'm I would be quite pessimistic about that. Right. Yeah. Right. It's it's instead uh, computation only works in the way that it works in so far as you have the kind of space time. Yeah, I wouldn't right worry now. about that from a practical point of view. Um, um, I think we're, well, it's it's very hard to say, in, you know, about the very, very, very long range. Right now, we have to depend enormously on computation and we should just do it in the regular way. Even if you're computing stuff for something bizarre like, um, you know, quantum field theory, <clears throat> and you're trying to compute. Um, stuff there where this where the the physics and the physics of the realm the realm is going to be really different than the Newtonian. Okay, so I wanted to ask you about you had a chapter in the laboratory, the mind book, about a Platonist interpretation of quantum mechanics, um, essentially talking about Bohr, Copenhagen, and a literal view. Of oh, um, well, uh, yeah, uh, the ordinary views of. Uh, it's hard to say what's ordinary anymore. Um, I th the Copenhagen interpretation was for years dominant and it has uh, lots and lots of problems. And I think um, it's pretty much died <clears throat> as a, you know, there's still some people who follow it, uh, but the people who follow it mostly don't care about the issue. They just, they just have, they, they learn stuff from a textbook many years earlier and, and that's just the way they operate. <clears throat> Most people <clears throat> who work on, on foundational issues in quantum mechanics, well, I don't know if there's any consensus at all. There's lots of people who believe in many worlds, lots of believe uh, who believe in GRW, lots of people who believe in um, Bohmian mechanics <clears throat> <clears throat> and so on. I, I don't know. Uh, when, I, when I wrote uh, that, quantum mechanical chapter in that book. This is the laboratory of the mind, right? Yeah, <clears throat> that was a long time ago. And I had a, I had the idea that I might be able to make a Bohm type view work, but a Platonistic ver a version of it. So um, um, it's not clear in, you know, how Bohmian mechanics works exactly. Uh, some people interpret the, what he called the quantum potential it's like a field, and some people interpret it as a field that 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 is through space and time, like the electromagnetic field. <clears throat> Except that when I jiggle something here, there's an immediate result uh, response way over there. Could be on the other side of the universe. It's instantaneous, and um, <clears throat> this is uh, this is problematic. Uh, well, it's just flat out contradicts special relativity. Okay. So I wondered if there was a way of doing it and um, with using app, instead of the quantum potential being inside space and time, put it outside of space and time and embed it in laws of nature so that you can get sort of the same effect without the transfer of anything through space and time and maybe save special relativity <clears throat> by doing that. But I, I don't think it was particularly successful. Okay. Yeah, so... Uh, a general question. 
about the philosophy of science. What are your views on reductionism? Uh, I know reductionism can sometimes be a complex set of beliefs. No, no strong, well-developed thoughts at all. Um, I, <clears throat> I'm, I'm probably instinctively not a reductionist. Um, uh, mostly because of the just inherent implausibility. But, but uh, where things go wrong, I just don't know. If I look at uh, uh, physics, it seems obvious that chemistry just reduces to physics. I have chemistry friends who get very angry when they hear that. <laughs> and for all I know, they are right to get angry. Okay. Now, uh, then when you start thinking about biology, <clears throat> especially on the molecular level, sure seems like chemistry to me. And, uh, <clears throat> but the biologists will say, come on, you know, wake up. <clears throat> but if I start at the other end and say, um, um, uh, let's take the truckers, pro the truckers, pro the other end being high uh, so organized society. Okay, <clears throat> let's take the truckers protest in Ottawa uh, a few weeks ago. <clears throat> How do you explain that? Try to imagine going to the first principles of quantum mechanics and, and writing down the Schrodinger equation for, you know, truckers <laughs> and trucks and and uh, a, a city and, and all of that, and then trying to solve it and say, there, that's why you had the trucker strike. That just seems so preposterous that um, it, 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 I don't know how anyone can be a, a reductionist when they start thinking about those sorts of examples. Now, I, I do have philosophical friends who will say, uh, say, no, nah, that's not the problem. The problem is consciousness. Consciousness is, that's the problem. It's known as the hard problem and so on. <clears throat> I don't have really strong views about that. Um, I appreciate um, my friends who, who, who do take that view. And for all I know, they're probably right. I don't know. What about you? I mean, the way that I tend to think of it, the, the safe way that I tend to think of it, <laughs> the safe way that I tend to think of it is that even if you can have ontological reduction to say number and successor function, and then from mathematics to physics to chemistry to biology onwards to to cognition, psychology, behavior, and beyond. Even if you have ontological reduction like that, you will still have an explanatory problem. You will still need to develop languages, fields to describe whatever set of phenomena that you're concerned with. And it's the the attempt to try to break away from one language to another doesn't seem like a hopeful pursuit to me. Oh no! Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you're completely right. Yeah, um, and you're right to uh, use that sort of terminology. I would have said, uh, which I think is more or less the same. Yes, Ontolo there's ontological reduction, and that might actually be true. And and then there's the terms I would use is methodological reduction. But I think I think it's the same idea. So it's clear that the methods of the social scientists cannot be the same methods as the physicists. Uh, and you need <clears throat> new concepts to organize and new techniques to determine. And <clears throat> so you'll do, you'll do polls, you'll ask people questions, which you would never do in physics. You don't ask, you don't interrogate a molecule um, and ask what its opinion is. Um, yeah, I, uh, I completely, uh, I agree. And so, and, 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 and in a certain sense, that's, that's so obvious and that's not gonna change. I cannot imagine I cannot imagine the methodological reduction ever being carried out. Yeah, the, the only way I think you can have that is by birthing a new field. Sorry, is by? Well, by creating a new field. I think, for example, if you have some big breakthrough in, in biochemistry, or, or say in say, say molecular chemistry, where you learn something new about, say, the origin of life, that tells you something so profoundly new that it can, that the theory can no longer keep up with the established field, and then you have a breakaway. But even then, the the end state of that is the exact same thing, where you have ontological reduction, but you're still going to need to develop some local set of fields, methods, language that describes what you want to describe. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm sure, I'm sure you're right. I completely agree. 
Yeah. And uh, debates about reduction need to make sure they're talking about the two different things. Because uh, when, when you talk to a physicist who's an arch reductionist, they almost always just mean ontological reduction. <clears throat> right, yeah. right, right. And <clears throat> oftentimes they're not quite sure why they're fighting this reductions battle. Because oftentimes what's at stake is not some problem in physics or, or bio or chem, but it's some problem in at the level of politics or economics, for example. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, wonderfully interesting uh, topics, for sure. So, shifting gears, or kind of shifting gears a little bit, uh, naturalism. 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 What are your general thoughts on naturalism these days? I'm not a naturalist, but, but maybe I should say, well, you, you better elaborate first. Uh, for some people, naturalism means simply the rejection of religion. Okay, you want to stay to natural forces, natural causes, natural everything. Uh, in that sense of naturalism, I'm all for it. I think there's no place for religion in explaining <clears throat> how the world works. Um, uh, but, but for most philosophers, that's not what they mean. <clears throat> what they mean is um, you've got to use the methods and the ontology of the natural sciences to explain everything. And um, so immediately the two big problems are ethics and mathematics, because you're just not going to be able to explain and reduce, et cetera, et cetera, mathematics to, <clears throat> to natural stuff. So I'm, I count myself as a staunch anti-naturalist uh, with most of my philosophical friends. Outside, when, when people, I, I sometimes do these debates um, with um, uh, Christian evangelicals about, you know, does God exist? Is, do we need God <clears throat> to be moral people and so on? They often use natural and naturalism as the antithesis of um, uh, a religious outlook. So they would they would call me a naturalist, and 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 sneer. Uh, a humanist, a humanistic naturalist. Yeah, and that and that that comes with a sneer. Okay, so I'm proud to be a naturalist in that sense, but uh, with my philosophical friends, they 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 religion just doesn't even come up. <clears throat> it's just a question of can we account for mathematics in terms of natural science somehow. I say no. So is that because of some big ontological position or mm. philosophical belief that you find standing in the way of believing naturalism? Or is it because you think there are still some elusive questions that naturalism can't answer? Like I think in the book, uh, you talk about the elusive M's. So mind, morality, um, it, essentially, mind, morality, consciousness. These yeah, a whole lot of uh, there's a whole lot of stuff that's um, really hard for a naturalist yeah, to account for. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, uh, a whole lot of questions that naturalism that a naturalist right. position still can't answer. Um, it, stuff that doesn't fit into a well ordering of the fields, or doesn't fit into a reduction of the fields, uh, and therefore it's not a successful or enticing research program to follow, or is it? Or is it more of a so so yeah so is it is it some deep philosophical reason or is it more of a practical consideration? I I guess a philosophical consideration. So I don't think you can account. So so a naturalist says okay on, the ontology has to be physical, has to be you know natural stuff, and I don't think you can account for the ontology of mathematics that way. Um, the epistemology has to be. It usually boils down to empiricism. A naturalist is just a physicalist who is an empiricist. <clears throat> and, uh, <clears throat> and I think, no, you, you need more than that. You need something like mathematical intuitions. Uh, so I claim, and this is anti-naturalist as anyone can be, that we have the cognitive capacity to grasp some mathematical objects and some mathematical truths. So they come like, they are intuitions. <clears throat> These, and now here I'm, I, I have to resort to metaphors and just say, we see things with the mind's eye. And it's not, it's not normal empiricism at all. It's like perception, but it's, it's a different kind. It's a kind of intellectual perception. 
<clears throat> and I claim I can see things and um, with the mind's eye, and I cannot account for that with ordinary sense perception, sight, hearing, taste, you know, those. Uh, <clears throat> and so that's what makes me a non-empiricist and a non-naturalist. So do you keep up with the the epistemic projects to try to explain mathematics away? Um, I know in the book you mentioned George Lakoff and and metaphors. Metaphors is a way yeah. to ground mathematical knowledge. But just yeah. in general, the, the embodied approaches in cognitive science, uh, a whole host of approaches in behavioral psychology and so on. What, what, do, you, what do you make of them? Well, uh, I, no, I, I suppose I have to be uh, uh, candid and say I don't keep up with it. Uh, I did read the Lakoff Nunez book, and I was completely unpersuaded by it. I thought it was very bad. Um, the the kind of, in fact, I can I can give you reasons. I, I think I can remember some of the reasons. It was <coughs> it was truly terrible. I thought the book was just terrible. Um, he he can't account for even the most trivial things in math. So he thought he starts out with a metaphor, kind of metaphor I would use if I were. Uh, teaching elementary set theory, I'd say, okay, sets are, they collect things. You can think of a set as like a basket and you put apples in the basket. So the basket is the set and the apples are the members of the set. Now you can have a special set called the empty set. That's just a basket with no apples in it. Okay, you got it? And you can take, um, you can, and in one big basket, you could put a smaller basket. And you can have apples in, in the bigger basket, but not in the small basket. And you can have apples in the small basket and the small baskets in the bigger basket. And this metaphor will take you a long way in set theory. But here's where it immediately breaks down. <clears throat> so I've got, uh, I've got um, uh, a set and it's got a small set in it and it's got an apple in the small set. That's apple A. It's a particular apple. And this is in set theory, okay? Set theory, set inside, apple A in the set in the interior set. The apple A is also outside the small basket. So in the big basket, there's apple A, and there's a basket with apple A in the little basket too. That's perfectly legitimate set theory. This does not work in the world. This now I would have to have one object in two distinct places. Works in set theory because sets aren't in space. Baskets are in space. And this and that then so the basket metaphor works for a few things, but it'll quickly break down. And there's no basket metaphor that'll carry you to the example I just gave. And um, and this is why. <coughs> you can't think of it. You can't think of it with the um, the kinds of uh, metaphors that um, that Lakoff wants to give. And in, in fact, what happens is, I claim, um, like any Platonist would claim, the empirical world helps treater things. It helps, you know, it's suggestive and so on. But at some point, there's an intellectual grasp, and you and you intellectually understand basic set theory and how sets are structured, how they interact, and, that does, and it does not copy the physical world. I mean, maybe it goes back to what we were talking about with reductions, that the two projects might just be different projects. Sorry, the two? The, the two projects of understanding what mathematics is, yeah. uh, what mathematical knowledge is, and understanding how we, as cognitive agents, or whatever kind of agents we are, have a grip on that. I mean, even if they're ontologically related, even if you need to understand what one what mathematical knowledge is to be able to explain how we have understanding of it, it, it might not be the case that you can put in epistemic terms the the nature of mathematics. I don't know. Um, yeah, I would I'm, sorry. That, just but, the main question I have yeah. is that do you think those are related? That we need to be able to explain those in a single breath. In a single sense. Yeah, yeah, we do, we do. Uh, otherwise, otherwise, um, 
Well, if they're just totally disconnected, then when I try to explain something in math and try to convince you that this is true, you have to say, yeah, well, what's this got to do with math? Because it's this totally other thing. <coughs> um, no, they've got to be connected. Um, so I, what I would say first is, here's what we're learning from mathematicians. I will not go so far as to say that is absolutely certainly the given. You're not you, cognitive scientist or philosopher of mathematics. You're not allowed to argue with that. That's as if God parted the clouds and said, this is it. Figure it out if you like, but don't tell me it's wrong. All right. I don't think I won't go so far as to say that, but pretty damn close. OK, so you uh, as a cognitive scientist or a philosopher of mathematics, whatever you're going to say about what's going on with math, it better be compatible with what mathematicians say are here are the theorems. OK, if, if it's going to end up <clears throat> you're contradicting all these theorems, you say, no, 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 don't you understand? You guys are talking about infinite sets. We, cognitive science, have proven they're unthinkable. You can't know about them. So you've got to change the math. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to let you take that side. Yeah, that, that's totally fair. I, I, I think cognitive science probably has the burden of proof on its back. Yes. It's got to comply. Same, same with philosophy of physics. Uh, you, you don't want to go around telling, uh, telling physicists no, that they're confused about time in special relativity. You know, they got it wrong. We yeah. understand. So, <laughs> <coughs> okay, so so shifting gears a little bit, uh, how did you come to think about ethics? Um, well, the it's always been the case in the, the long history of philosophy. <clears throat> whenever empiricism comes up, um, other philosophers who are anti-empiricist, or even if they are empiricist, throw two things in their face: ethics and mathematics. There's other things you can worry about too, but those are the two big ones. How can an empiricist make sense of math? Um, and how can an empiricist make sense of ethics? Okay, because they're not, we don't learn those things empirically the way we learn physics or biology. <clears throat> so um, empiricists will hang on to their empiricism and, and then try to tell you what math is in a way that's compatible. So A.J. Ayer, who did this for math and did it for ethics both in a, in a wonderful little book called Language, Truth, and Logic. Um, many of the uh, people who watch this seminar, uh, who, sorry, who watch your podcast, um, <clears throat> if they're looking for introductory books in philosophy that are readable and really meaty, I would highly recommend A.J. Ayer. I don't believe a word of it, but it is spectacularly good book. We'll just sweep you right along and give you a vision of the world, which is very compelling. Okay, strongly empiricist. Okay, so he has to worry about math. Uh, you can't be a Platonist because you, you, can't, you can't see Platonic objects. That's no good. So what is math? <clears throat> he said, oh, it's just, it's language. Math is really language. So we've got these words. One, two, three, four, five. We've got these operations plus multiplication and so on. Well, <clears throat> what math is, is a very elaborate system of analytic truths. They're not truths about the world. They're just truths about language. And a simple example is the classic bachelors are unmarried males. That's a truth about language. It's not a truth about the world. Uh, if you didn't know English <clears throat> and you were learning and someone said, do you think all bachelors are unmarried males? You might go out and take a survey and you find what a coincidence. Yeah, everyone who's a bachelor seems to be an unmarried male. Except that guy who doesn't speak English very well. He was a little confused about it. <clears throat> uh, and then you, you gradually come to realize that it's, it wasn't even an empirical question. It was really about words. It's just the definition of bachelor is unmarried male. We could never discover someone who was other than that. It's not an empirical truth. And <clears throat> so Ayer wanted to say all of mathematics is like that. Five plus seven equals 12 is a more complicated 
analytic truth, but it's the same kind of thing. So if this is the case, well, it's not empirical knowledge. It's knowledge of language, a particular language, mathematical language. That's all it is. It's not a, it, it's not a, a, a truth about anything. <clears throat> and the second thing he had to say something about, which, so you see how he saves empiricism. It's not threatened by math anymore. <coughs> Excuse me <clears throat> for coughing so much. Not, I've got, a problem. Uh, Not a problem. I've got something in my throat today. <clears throat> ethics. Well, what about ethics? So Air says, well, the truth about ethics is they're not their ethical claims aren't true. Murder is wrong is not a fact. Stealing is wrong. Rape is wrong. These are not facts. Helping people is not a fact. What they are, when I say something like that, if I say, um, setting kittens on fire is wrong. What I'm really doing is expressing my emotion. I'm saying I'm really repelled at the thought. I don't like it. And this view became known as the uh, hooray boo theory of ethics. That an ethical statement is neither true nor false. It's just one which we have an attitude. We say hooray for that or Boo, hiss, that. So again, empiricism is safe because these are not in, in these are not truths about anything. They're just emotional um, emotional attitudes we have. So the earlier version of that is the <clears throat> indispensability argument, right? Uh, Putnam Quine. Oh, um, okay. This this you could say this is a reaction to that. Yeah. So. Um, so, uh, um, right. Oh, there's a long. It's a long story <laughs> from here. <coughs> Indispensability is a uh, the people who like it. Quine and Putnam on the one hand, and more recently, <clears throat> Baker and Colivan. Um, they are. They are uh, at. At one and the same time, they're naturalists about in ontology. Okay, <clears throat> no, excuse me, excuse me. They're Platonists in ontology. That is, they all think numbers exist, functions exist, sets exist in the Platonic realm. Are they? Would you call them realists? Yeah, they're realists. But I'm splitting it up. I'm splitting up Platonism and realism into two ingredients. Uh, the ontological ingredient of um, Platonism or realism and the epistemic. <clears throat> now, for someone like me, I am a gung-ho Platonist in both senses. This, this really amounts to intuitions. I believe I have the cognitive apparatus to actually grasp uh, mathematical facts, simple ones. <clears throat> they say they are happy with the ontological part. Numbers exist. They're really queasy about thinking you can see them. <clears throat> so they have to find a way that they can have knowledge of numbers without the cognitive part that worries them. In other words, they want to be Platonists about numbers and be empiricists when it comes to epistemology. Okay, how do they do it? How do they do it? They say, well, <clears throat> you got some physics and you got a bit of math and it makes predictions. So the physics, bit of Newtonian physics, including Newton's gravity theory, some initial conditions about where Mars is today, a bit of trigonometry, a bit of analytic geometry, maybe some calculus. Therefore, here's where Mars will be next Tuesday at midnight. Okay, so you derive a conclusion. You can check the conclusion, you go out at midnight next Tuesday. Yeah, there's Mars, exactly where predicted. Well, who gets credit for that prediction? <clears throat> Newton's theory of gravity, for sure, but so does trigonometry and calculus and analytic jump. They all get a little boost from this. Okay, <clears throat> so you see that it's in, they get empirical support because they <clears throat> they helped, and um, and this was an indispensability argument. So science can't be done without some math. Science is is, is doing a good job. Math is part of doing that good job. So math gets credit and we have to take math seriously as a thing 
that exists right. independently from us. It's not just right. fiction we're making up. So you say both that way. Yeah. Okay. So that those are the indispensable. That's the spirit of indispensability. <clears throat> now there's some subtleties, differences between Putnam and Quine on the one hand, and, and Baker and Colivan on the other, but you got the general idea. Okay. <clears throat> so so the thing is, they wouldn't like me because I they think uh, I don't I'm not. I, I like their conclusion just fine. You know, I, I'm not hostile to their conclusion, but I think we also have intuitions as a source of. Uh, so, getting back to ethics, uh, I want to talk about thought experiments and how you came up with the refutation of the continuum hypothesis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I know you're not concerned with refuting the continuum hypothesis, but what it shows about thought experiment. Well, the, 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 uh, that thought experiment is due to uh, Chris Freiling. Uh, an American uh, uh, logician. <clears throat> um, he published it a few years ago. A few people, uh, including some really important mathematicians, uh, loved it. They thought it was terrific. I'd say most people, you know, they're, they didn't accept it. Um, I'm not sure where it stands. I know some people who are quite sure it's false <clears throat> and others who are quite sure it's, it works. <clears throat> So it's one of those problematic examples that um, we, uh, we can fight over. What interests me is not so much whether it's correct or not, though I hope it's correct. And I'm slightly inclined to think it's correct. But what I found wonderful about it is that it was a thought experiment which can settle a question inside math. And it's unique in that way because there are lots of visual uh, the little thought experiments and visual arguments inside math, which we can argue whether or not they work, but <clears throat> they usually have a, um, a counterpart, regular proof of the same result. So you could say, never mind the thought experiment, I don't need it, I've got a proof, that's legit, that's all I need. But in the case of the continuum hypothesis, it is independent of the rest of set theory, and in fact, independent of all of math. You cannot prove it and you cannot refute it. It stands alone. So this little thought experiment uh, could settle it one way or the other and settle it in favor of it's false. <coughs> so I thought it was uh, remarkably interesting. It's, it's an interesting little thought experiment in its own right, but it's also especially interesting because of its status. Right. It's, it's philosophically interesting in what it tells us about. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> so the... I'm sorry, I forget who was credited with this. Um, I'm sorry, the name escapes me. But the the idea that proofs are truth plus guarantee. Uh, yes, um, uh, Gowers, Timothy Gowers, right? Gowers, yes, thank you. Yes, Timothy Gowers. Is that a a good model for how to think about intuition, or or maybe you could just flush that out a little? No, bit. Uh, it, it that's really interesting. I mean, most most mathematicians. I mean, the standard ideology is that you need a proof. <clears throat> and then every working mathematician will say, you know, some proofs do nothing but prove. And other proofs are terrific because they not only prove, but they give you that aha feeling. Oh, now I see what's going on. It's not merely establishing the theorem, but it, it's, it's like it, it, you, now you understand it. Okay? It's not just it's not just evidence, but it gives you a kind of understanding <clears throat> which you didn't have before. Um, Gowers uh, thinks that a good proof should be um, the uh, guarantee, and that then he just by the guarantee he just means a regular derivation. Not very interesting idea, um, and um, and the explanation part that's where everyone is focused on what Gowers thinks about an explanation. So he has particular views about how an explanation goes, and mostly it's of the form, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, I tried this strategy, I tried that strategy, and eventually I began to see that this other strategy might provide uh, some evidence I worked through, blah, 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 and bingo, <coughs> problem solved. Um, that's his idea of, uh, of an explanation. 
Um, when, I, when I began to, to read his stuff, he's, he's a really terrific mathematician. Uh, but he, he, he indulges in philosophy all the time. I'm not sure he realizes it, but, you know, he talks about the nature of math and a whole lot of very informal stuff that's often very interesting. And, and, and this was one of it. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, guarantee. Guarantee an explanation, and and it was and it was sort of funny. It was just it was one of those trigger words, where I was <clears throat> I was just thinking about it. guarantee, guarantee. And I began to think, how often do I hear the word guarantee in my life, and it's almost never in the in the Tim Gower sense of a proof. And I think you know I buy things and they come with a guarantee, and that sort of guarantee is not like how people can conceive a mathematical guarantee, a proof. <clears throat> they think a guarantee is certainty. But anything I buy with a guarantee is no, it's not certain at all. It just gives you a, it says it, it will be true or you can get your money back. I think I used the example of a toaster. <clears throat> and I buy a toaster and, and the guarantee says it'll work or we'll give you your money back or we'll fix it, or we'll replace it. You know, it's something like that, and that's a guarantee. And I thought, you know, that's a, not a bad way of thinking about proofs. This is different than the empiricism, being anti-empiricist. This is about certainty in math and what, what should count as evidence. And I think we should, we should be much more liberal about evidence and try to learn more mathematics in virtue of a, a slightly more liberal view of it, the same sort of standards we would use in physics. I mean, we don't just believe anything in physics. We want good, solid evidence, but it's a hell of a lot weaker than the standard of, you know, strict derivation. And uh, <clears throat> so I began to think of proofs, you know, in more like the sense of a toaster guarantee, and that maybe math should offer us an explanation plus guarantee, where the guarantee is of a similar to a toaster. <clears throat> then I began to think, well, okay, what would it be like to have such a guarantee? Well, of course, if you had a straight derivation, that's fine. Other things would be sort of like statistical guarantees, uh, and, you, and you have a sense of, well, when it might fail, and, and so on, and stuff like that. And then you start thinking about these things, and thinking about new standards for what counts as good evidence. Working mathematicians can't possibly live using just derivations as evidence. Their research lives would just collapse. <clears throat> they have to have a sense of evidence for what's a good problem to work on. If they're, a good, if they're good PhD supervisors, they have to know what is a good problem to give to a student. Say, work on this. You don't want to give the student, I mean, if you wanted to kill the student, you say, come back when you've, when you've solved the Riemann hypothesis. Okay. That would be death to any student. And a good mathematician knows what's, what, what, what a student can plausibly do, you know, as a suitable project. It's got to be tough enough, but not too hard, and, you know, yeah. that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, shifting gears a little bit. I, I really want to talk about the rural science book. Um, I thought I'd be talking to you about thought experiments a whole lot more, but I just got so oh. caught up reading this book and the, the sociological turn book. Yeah, I, I, yeah I, I found it really, really a great book. No, I mean, tremendous book for anyone who wants to understand how, how the, the sciences have had conflict in the past couple of decades. So yeah, I just want to start off with what is social constructivism? Sure. What are your thoughts about it? Um, <clears throat> Well, the, the basic idea is that um, um, we are making things up. <clears throat> we are not so much discovering the truths about the world, but constructing what passes as the truths for the world. <clears throat> and the basis of the construction is, <clears throat> I'm sorry about my throat. The basis, the basis of, of the construction is, social interests and things like that. <clears throat> what counts as social construction has changed a lot in the past 40 years or so. 
uh, the, <clears throat> the current version was probably started in the 70s, uh, 1970. I think, I think one of the first articles is the Foreman article about Weimar scientists and the birth of quantum mechanics. <clears throat> A lot of it takes off from there. And it went through uh, the 1970s with people like Bloor and Barnes having a huge role and so on. And, 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 and those people knew a lot of science. They, they were, uh, many of them had a, a good science education, but they were, they were beginning to, to be suspicious of a whole lot of stuff and this, this sort of try to give it a new uh, uh, and different interpretation <clears throat> when where social factors are playing a huge role. Um, there was a, there's another version of it coming from the literary people who usually don't know much um, <clears throat> uh, science at all and are just, will just glum on to something fancy that's sort of zippy like heisenberg's uncertainty principle and then try to say things about it you know that's kind of much of that's pretty silly the <clears throat> the the science studies people are the the more interesting one they need to be taken seriously most philosophers didn't like them at all really didn't like them and they really didn't like philosophers that's because they see, they saw philosophers as just defending science and the philosophers saw them as attacking science stupidly. Okay, um, as time has passed, each has learned a hell of a lot from the other. So there's a lot less conflict now. And in fact, when I first got interested in this, Harry Collins, who's a, a, a major character, um, uh, said reality has got nothing to do with science, <laughs> meaning. You know, forget the world. It's got nothing to do with the world. Scientific theories and scientists and so on are just in a world of <clears throat> their own making. And I, and he has since backtracked on that, and and he'll actually make fun of himself when he's doing it. <clears throat> and he, well, not that recently now, but he wrote a book on uh, gravity waves. It was very well received by the scientific community. Philosophers largely liked it. I have one or two friends who thought it was terrible, but <clears throat> for the most part, they thought it was pretty good. And and um, and Collins Collins still you know emphasizes social factors in all of this, but he certainly thinks there's a world out there to be interacted with. So, so when it all started, <clears throat> just to give some context here, with the Paul Gross and Norman Levitt book, uh, Higher Superstition. It was essentially postmodernists, just yep. given an umbrella term, who who claimed that scientific mathematical knowledge was socially constructed and reflected power structures. That's right. Uh, and mathematicians, scientists, and for the most part, philosophers who weren't postmodernists had a pretty heavy reaction against this. Um, but then you have you have a change in that from higher superstition to SoCal, the fashionable nonsense book, where things get a lot more sophisticated. Uh, you he introduces the the left right distinction. And yeah, the, the, the reason I got interested in it, and well, I've always been very political and very left wing. My politics are way over on the left. But unlike many people who are postmodern and many of the critics of science who are also on the left, okay, we just disagreed completely. So I'm super pro science. And think of science as the friend of oppressed people. You know, science will help us and will save us. Facts are really important, like the facts about how many people are living in poverty and, you know, and the scourge of disease and how it affects different classes differently and so on. These are hugely important, says me. And Sokol is exactly the same. So Sokol, Sokol is very, very left wing, extremely left wing. And, <clears throat> and he um, did the hoax article that you 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 know about now quite famous. right so just just to give people some context here um sokol published an article in sort of a postmodern friendly journal that was just filled with jargon nonsense just absolute rubbish absolute rubbish absolute. um it was relating what was it the abortion rights the, the axiom of choice <laughs> to abortion rights um yeah. and just crazy crazy stuff like that and it got published and from there, he wrote the fashionable nonsense book, making a criticism of uh, postmodernism and these kinds of ideas. 
Uh, and that's an important book. That's a really important book. Just sort of as a personal anecdote. I remember uh, growing up as a philosophy undergrad, reading reading the classics and, and moderns and so on, and getting to to the postmoderns and kind of being really taken back by by the shift. And naively, I, I sort of thought I was developing these original criticisms of, of it until I read the Sokol book. And then I'm like, no, people people have thought of this before. Um, it's an important book, but it's it's important to realize that Sokol isn't one-dimensional. He he makes a striking striking distinction between the pro science left and the pro science right. And in your book, you sketch out a, yeah, a yeah. rough matrix of that. Where on the left you have right. uh, folks like Chomsky and 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 Sokol and Jay Gould and Richard Wanton at the time, um, and all, all sorts of folks in biology. But on the right, you also have right. people who are technically pro science but want to promote. Um, race IQ fallacy and things like that. And I guess what I'm trying to ask is this this book was written in 2004. Um, so in the past 20 odd years, have you seen a change? Uh, public intellectuals and how they interact with postmodern ideas and these kinds of tough fields and, and, and social questions, have you seen any kind of a shift? Um. I would say uh, that there's still science wars, but they're not <clears throat> not like they were. So <coughs> most of the people who I would have attacked <clears throat> and Sokol would have attacked in, <clears throat> in, in a book like that, <clears throat> they're now in departments of science studies and they still pay an awful lot of attention to social factors uh, connected with science. <clears throat> but they but they tend to spend less time attacking the content of science as opposed to scientific institutions and how they arise and how and how those institutions can lead to bad things so i mean <clears throat> if you just have an institution and and it doesn't do anything in terms of affirmative action then it's just going to produce a whole lot of male white male um, um, theorizers who might be as scientific as anyone could be in the sense that they're highly critical. But the trouble is they have a very narrow range of imagination. And so they're trying to think of new theories and they're, and they're, they're constrained by their, their background. They're not evil. They're not, um, you know, they're not out to get women or, or visible minorities or anything like that. They just don't have the experience. And, and so an institution which, which makes sure it's got, you know, lots of non-white men in it is bound to have a much greater um, possibility of theoretical options. And then all of the good things about science, you know, what's the evidence for this? What's the evidence for that? That can all take place and it, and it, and it can improve things enormously. So I think people who worry about those sort of things are uh, are important, and they've improved um, thinking about science an awful lot. Now you get a lot of philosophers who were hesitant about that before and said, "Why should it matter whether you're a man or a woman? It's just getting the ideas right." <clears throat> and they've come to realize, no, it's a lot more complicated than that, and it doesn't have to be evil, nasty people. They're just you just need to uh, engineer institutes like that, uh, and there's a ton of uh, there's a ton of stuff which is not threatening to the content of science, which is about institutions and you know um, and stuff which is just intrinsically interesting. Where do scientists come from? Are they working class people? <clears throat> are they aristocrats? Are they middle class people? You know, um, are they men? Are they women? What happens to women when they're young that might encourage them to become scientists or discourage them? These are all wonderfully interesting and important questions, and it's all part of this very broader thing. I mean, one thing I thought of reading your work was, are there pure and applied scientists? That if if you're working in, in some narrow space in your field and sort of applying a standard method and and not really focusing on the on the big theoretical questions, integration questions, standard unification problems within your field, then then your ability to deal with larger problems in outside the domain of your inquiry are are going to be hampered. Yeah, yeah, uh, true. Um, 
there are clearly areas of the sciences which you would have to call pure <clears throat> by but it's going to be fuzzy but but er, some areas of your, like if you work in in theoretical cosmology that's just about as unapplied as anything could be you can you can go to the public and to politicians and say give us money <clears throat> um we don't know what wonderful things we'll discover, and they may be really useful, <laughs> but but they're lying. Uh, and of course, they, they know it's possible, uh, but but they know that they're exaggerating wildly. <clears throat> and um, uh, on the other hand, I mean, a lot of stuff in medicine, you know, where you're just doing cancer research, it's 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 somewhere between pure and applied. You know, you're trying to figure out what triggers a cell to become cancerous, and um, and uh, that could be that looks like pure research. But you know, if you if you figure that out, you may be only a couple of steps away from a therapy that will will be you know extremely. Useful. So you said that Sokol gave us the the flag of reason to rally around, and I think that's very very true. In, in every generation of intellectual, yep. especially public intellectual, you have mm -hmm. someone coming out from a place of scientific experience and arguing uh, arguing for people to be more rational or to be more reasonable and, and criticizing people, often people who are trying to make uh, strides toward, towards solving cultural problems, problems of inequality, real world social problems that have consequence. And, and sometimes these criticisms are valid and sometimes they're not. Right, I, I myself struggle with, with saying a general word about it, like like you said, it depends whether we're talking about about cosmology or medicine, but how do you think we should treat these folks and these approaches that are dealing with real cultural problems, real social problems, real problems of inequality that have consequence, where they're they're working in spaces that don't quite have the the sort of robust intellectual traditions that we're used to that don't have time evidence that don't have frameworks that don't have methods that don't have a, a, a historical philosophical legacy or xyz think they don't have the the background where you could do you could do the kind of proper philosophy and science that we're used to uh how do you think we should interact with those kinds well, of well i i strongly encourage them to um you know to do their thing and uh, encourage uh, the rest of us to pay attention to it and uh, <clears throat> listen to it, criticize what needs to be criticized, support what needs to be supported, and, um, and often say helpful things. Uh, people who naively uh, um, are uh, um, looking, you know, surveying populations for looking for, you know, patterns, and they're starting to come up with some, and and maybe they get lucky and some clever statistician listens to them, just happens to hear what they said and say, wow, this is <clears throat> really interesting. Did you know from your data, I can extract the following? And, uh, and you know, you just get the ball rolling and, and, and it can be wonderful for us all. You need people. And especially when it's more real, like dealing with a, a economic problem. Yeah, yeah is for the most part more real than dealing with a problem in say cosmology. I don't want to offend any yeah. cosmologists here. Uh, yeah, don't use the word real. They're equally real. You mean just more right. immediate of immediate human right. My concern. apologies. It, it, yeah, say more <clears throat> salient to human experience. Yeah. Um, but just to put in a word for cosmology, utterly useless in any practical sense, utterly useless. But it's, it's one of those things that makes life worth living. That is, for many human beings, in fact, all of us, to some extent, we're curious about those wonderful big questions, you know, where did we come from? What's, what's it all, you know, how does it work? Um, were we really created by God like that 6,000 years ago? Or did we evolve from apes and so on? These are just wonderfully interesting questions. And it's what makes us human. In the, in the good sense, <clears throat> what makes us human is that we're curious about these things and that we invest time and energy in thinking about them and, and, and we're critical in coming to answers. 
So what are some useless problems that you're concerned? Yeah, I, I think, uh, well, I, they're probably, uh, cosmology is, I, I think I can safely say currently, quite useless. But absolutely wonderful. I'm thrilled at the new uh, uh, telescope, the what's it called, the Webb telescope. <clears throat> and I'm really looking forward to the stuff that's going to come back pretty soon about that. That's going to be incredibly interesting and exciting. But it won't, it won't, um, it won't cure COVID. It won't stop the war in the Ukraine. It won't help with poverty. It, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> but it's wonderful. It's what makes all of those other things worth tackling so that people who are impoverished can become educated and then enjoy the things that they were meant to enjoy, namely cosmology. Beautifully said. <laughs> Uh, were some not so useless ones. Oh well, uh, there's just endlessly um, interesting things, I suppose, that are you know in cancer research and uh, and all kinds of other things. You know, er occasionally I I don't read everything that I see you know um, on these things, but I read the occasional science article in newspapers <clears throat> about you know something new in some field it's, uh, that I really know nothing about, but I'll just read it out of curiosity and, and often you know what I read is really interesting you know <clears throat> new approaches to thinking about this or that or something like that often in medicine um, some of these things I have to admit I do have a maybe a, a kind of implicit interest in so uh, whenever I see a new article about something involving longevity you know like uh, Maybe this drug will stop your stop you aging <laughs> a little bit. <coughs> mm. So I read those. I read those with some interest. I take those to be uh, <clears throat> applied subjects, <clears throat> practical subjects. Um, very selfish <clears throat> interest in them, but sometimes they're just theoretically interesting. Like, oh, is that how it works? You know, that 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 can be fun and interesting. Yeah. Uh, disease, curing diseases, of course, <clears throat> the older I get, I'm, I'm expecting to develop something nasty, you know, any day now. And, and, I, and I, uh, uh, I hope everything can be cured <laughs> before it happens. But, but my interest, my, but that's probably no different than my interest in, say, the arts, you know, <clears throat> if I you know, a new novel that's curious and interesting in some way, you know, I'll be happy to, you know, indulge, spend time on that. So have you ever thought about aesthetics in the same ways that you've thought about uh, ethics and, and mathematics? Yeah, didn't we, we well, uh, all I could do is, at, at the very beginning of this interview, I think we talked briefly about aesthetics. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm afraid that's, the, that's pretty much the limit. So my, if I really spend a lot of time on aesthetics, I might change my mind. But right now, I love beautiful things. And I believe beautiful things are objectively beautiful. You know, I think, you know, a, a certain scene, as, as a sunset, a beautiful sunset, you know, glowing sunset. I think that's objectively beautiful. And I think some stuff in math is absolutely beautiful. It's just breathtakingly beautiful. But I don't think beauty and truth go together. We've all been ensnared by this, um, the two last lines of um, Keats's famous poem, it's Ode, Ode to a Grecian Urn, I think it is, right? Is that the one? Yeah. Truth is beauty, beauty, truth. That's all ye know on earth and all you need to know. I think, what rubbish. Nothing could be more wrong than that. <laughs> Though it's a, it's a wonderful sentiment, but it, and it carries everyone away. But I think it's just wrong. Yeah, but it, it's interesting. I I think it's fair to say that the role of art in society has grown very significantly over the past couple of decades, maybe maybe more, and and that confusion is out there. People often see art as a a way towards truth, and and look, there's truth to that. There, uh, I have probably had as many intuitions reading the piece of fiction as I have reading philosophy. But they're different in kind. Yeah, and the uh, um, 
that's interesting um and probably i'm just guessing but the reason you all right so you're reading the book happily because it's so beautiful and something very general it has a lot of aesthetic virtues <clears throat> and uh that carries you right along and then you learn something um about how how people tick um from the novel but you didn't learn that because the novel's beautiful you learned it because of the story conveyed it to you so the beauty of the story made you read the story and then you you then you learned something in the story but but you didn't but that story didn't hang on the beauty the beauty just sucked you in to start with right <clears throat> yes i mean we can have a we can have a conceptual idea of <clears throat> what truth knowledge theory are and a conceptual idea of what art and aesthetics are and every artifact of our experience sure. will undoubtedly <clears throat> muddy the difference between the two right like you yeah. can read einstein and and derive tremendous aesthetic value from it yeah. and and some knowledge from it and i'm sure the <clears throat> same is true of shakespeare but that doesn't right. compromise the conceptual difference between the two yeah uh, i i think uh, i think i agree yeah Good. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing this. Okay. It was a, it was a great it was a great pleasure, Asher. I um, thanks for inviting me on. <laughs>